Hello, this is uh, Reverend Sean here at the United Church of Christ Southbury. I'm not wearing a robe today. I actually didn't wear a robe today because we had our gathering day service, uh, which we had some rain. We did it inside, but then it wasn't raining too much. We went outside. Um, but because of all the moving, we there's always a technical issue. And so, uh, our service didn't end up on YouTube. And I know there were a bunch of people who asked if uh, they can have a copy of the sermon or if they could watch it again. I thought I would just uh, give you a, a, just the sermon so that it, here it's, it's up on YouTube. And if you want to share it or just review it yourself, uh, you're free to do so. Here's uh, the scripture reading. It's from Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. Uh, and this was a bit of a tongue twister, but has a lot of meat packed into it. It says, uh, we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I do for what I want to do, I don't do it. But what I hate, I do it. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you experienced this? This split in the mind where you know that you should not be doing something, but then there's this pull in you to do it anyway? or vice versa, you know that you should be doing something, but you don't do it. Like sometimes I'll walk over my son Abram's toys, uh, but there's a voice that says, pick it up. <laughs> I hear it, but only nine times out of 10 do I actually listen to it. Or I'll be having a debate with someone and I know, I know it's a dumb argument. And there's this part of me that's trying to tell me, let it go. But then there's this other part of me that's like, Oh, no way. We, we got to make our point, Sean. And it's almost like I have two personalities, two, a double consciousness happening within me. Where's the tension? Like I said, it's happening within me just as it's happening with Paul, the author of our text today. In psychoanalysis, we call this phenomenon splitting. Splitting refers to a psychological defense mechanism in which an individual tends to see people, situations, or concepts as either all good or all bad, right or wrong, with no middle ground. Uh, there's no recognition of nuance. This defense mechanism can lead to black and white thinking, unstable interpersonal relationships, and difficulty in integrating conflicting emotions and ideas. It can be easy to forget that the authors of the Bible were just people, just like us, and what any therapist would say is happening here is just that, splitting. So Paul's like, I have this part of me that loves God, loves every part of him. I delight in God's law. But then he says, what a wretch I am in this body of sin. I hate God's law. What's he doing? He's splitting. He's taking his whole self and cutting it down the middle, compartmentalizing two aspects of himself into black and white, good and bad, holy and unholy. And we see this everywhere in society. Uh, someone will say, I'm a conservative. Another person says, I'm a liberal. One says the West is the best, but just go talk to somebody in the East. The West is dominated by a certain ideology. The East is dominated by a certain ideology. Uh, Western religions are more intellectually based and Eastern religions are typically more mystically based. Splitting occurs everywhere in the world and within ourselves. It makes life easier as the saying goes, ignorance is bliss. 
And this defense mechanism, like I said, promotes one-sidedness and it pro promotes extreme views and half-truths. It allows for strong opinions and passionate perspectives, but as we have often seen, Anyone with a strong opinion one way is usually just defending against the alternative potential within themselves. That's why you see so many leaders, even pastors, who say one thing from the stage, but then you find out that their secret life uh, is saying the, the opposite. We've all been told, be nice, don't be bad, as if that was an option. We like to split. It makes life easier to tolerate as ambiguity and nuance is often very hard for people to hold. So where does this come from, this splitting? Why does Paul cut himself in half, blaming one part of himself for being good and another part of himself for being bad? It's because he can't hold the tension that he's made up of both good and bad aspects. Why does the whole world do this? Why do we do this? My wife one time, one time said to me, you're always meditating and reading. To which I said, that's nice. Remember to say that at my funeral. <laughs> but that's only one part of me. I doubt, I get angry. I do like Paul. I do what I shouldn't do and don't do what I should. I hate, I get frustrated. I sometimes feel lost in this whole Christian thing myself. And for a long time, I hated that part of me, just like Paul. That sometimes I can be a lovely person, but then I find myself not being a lovely person, as if I was created to be perfect, but couldn't live up to it. And in those times, I felt guilt and shame. I used to blame that on the devil. When I was good, I would blame that on God. I would split saying the same thing as Paul. I had to cut myself down the middle and in doing so, I created part of me that was good and a part of me that was evil. I was proud of my goodness, but ashamed of my darkness. We do that in our religion. We have a good guy and a bad guy, God and the devil. Both are very powerful as they both have the ability to sway humans in one direction or the other often expressed symbolically as the little angel on your shoulder or the demon on your shoulder. And if you open up the Bible to the first page, it's unbelievable, <laughs> you would see splitting everywhere. In Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God hovered over the tohu wahavhu, the chaotic and formless deep. And that, and that God swept over this void, this sea of chaos, and right away, he begins to split everything. God split the light from the darkness, day from night, the land from the sea, the flying creatures from the land creatures, and the land creatures from the sea creatures, to lastly, humans, who God split into two, masculine and feminine. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, So God created humankind in his image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God is both masculine and feminine, but that gets split and is expressed in the male-female dyad. If we continue reading, we see that God places how many trees in the garden? Two. One is good and one is bad. Two people, two trees, two supernatural creat uh, creatures speaking to these humans. One is God who walks in the garden. And then there's this other character who's represented as a snake who has just as much knowledge as God, who also has access to the humans and who's encouraging humans to do the opposite of what God told them to do. Then, Cain, uh, then Adam and Eve have two sons. Abel is good. Cain is bad. Why all of this splitting, this division of things, when clearly it all came from the same source, the tohu wahavu, the chaotic deep? Let us remember that splitting refers to a psychological defense mechanism in which an individual tends to see people, situations, or concepts as either all good or all bad, right or wrong, with no middle ground or recognition of nuance. This defense mechanism can lead to black and white thinking, unstable interpersonal relationships, and difficulty in integrating conflicting emotions and ideas. Who wrote the Bible? 
It surely wasn't God writing it per se. It was through these stories and ideas that came to us, uh, through the people who wrote them. And so we must read them knowing that. We must read it knowing that there's a tendency for humans to split things into categories, in this case, good and bad, light and dark, male and female, Cain and Abel, God and the snake. Paul does this with his inner life, with his mind. He says that there's this tension in him. Something is at odds with him, but he can't reconcile it. So he projects this tension onto God, who represents the good, and the devil, who represents the bad. But what's really going on? You know, splitting. Why? Because it's easier that way. It seems that way, at least. You see, for us, it's easier to, ha to have that than the alternative. And what's the alternative? You ready? <laughs> that good and bad, that heaven and hell, that God and the devil all come from one source and not two. Why is that hard to accept and swallow? Because splitting is a defense mechanism to protect us from that which would hurt, challenge, or disrupt how we view things. Take it, taking it away would be destabilizing. But what if it was the case that God and the devil, good and evil, male and female, were actually the same thing, but that we cut them in half because it's easier for us to deal with life that way? To see things as black and white, right and wrong, good and bad. Even thinking about these things uh, differently can hurt. I mean, let me ask, are you pro-choice or pro-life? Right, you got to choose one, right? You have to, or else. Are you pro-guns or pro-gun uh, disarmament? Are you conservative or liberal? You got to choose one. Do you? Are you an atheist or a theist? You got to choose. You see what we've done? We've all been sucked into this trap, into splitting. And why? Look at the text that gave birth to Western society. It has splitting all over it. Things have to be nicely packed into one or the other camp when the truth is actually found in both camps. Nobody likes to hear that. No one likes to hear that abortion has its place and that it's also a tragic thing. No one likes to hear that owning guns is rooted in what it means to be an American. We're the revolutionaries, the rough riders. But at the same time, regulation is needed. No one wants to hear that conservatives can sometimes be right about something, and so are liberals. No one wants to hear that we should take care of our own tribe and also find ways to take care of those outside of our tribe. So many of the world's issues are rooted in splitting because it's rooted in the biblical narrative, a book that has shaped us for thousands of years. As a psychoanalytic patient myself, don't worry, nothing's wrong with me. I'm a student, so I have to, to, I have to practice what I'm uh, practicing. Uh, as a psychoanalytic student myself, I've been horrified at how much of reality I've ignored by splitting, by seeing things in black and white with, without any nuance. But the biblical narrative doesn't end with Genesis. It doesn't just tell us that we're splitters. As you get near the end of the Bible, a new character comes onto the scene, but this time he's not splitting. It's not God created Jesus in his image. Rather, it's Jesus is the image of God, both human and divine, earthly and spiritual. Jesus doesn't act like the God people thought God would act like. One, he's a person. Two, watch what he sits with. He sits with what? Saints? No. He's going to do both. He sits with sinners and saints. He loves the wealthy and the poor. He heals Romans and Jews. He forgives wrong and doesn't condemn people. He invites men and women to be his disciples. He understands order and he understands chaos. He speaks to God. And who else does he speak to? Demons. In the wilderness, he doesn't flee from the devil within himself. He confronts it. He accepts it. He reconciles it. Reconcile means to restore friendly relations between cause to coexist in harmony, make or show to be compatible. Colossians 1 tells us, For God was pleased to have all his fullness 
black and white, light and dark, dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things. This is the gospel that you heard and that was proclaimed to every creature under heaven. And Christ calls us to be like him, to be a person who has reconciled the split, who understands the nuance of life, that we're both mortal and immortal, psychical creatures and physical creatures, fearful and courageous, anxious and secure, depressed and hopeful. And that darkness and light exist in us, as Solomon wrote in Song of Songs, dark am I but lovely. Jesus accepted himself, and in that he understands God, not the split God that we've cut in half, but the whole God. As John 1 states, out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Why have we received grace? Grace that was always there, forgiveness that was always there, but it was unknown to us until Jesus came. It's because we split God up. The forgiveness was always there. The grace was always there. But if we choose to walk the way of Jesus, we'll see that life's not so black and white. It's a mix of the whole lot, a gray pool. That's what you and I swim in. And when we give ourselves a break and stop just trying to be perfect all the time, always trying to do the right thing, we can then have some grace with ourselves, right? That's how you feel forgiveness. You say, hey, stop trying to be perfect with yourself. When you accept who you are, just like Jesus did, no splitting, just reality. You see, when we begin to face our issues and analyze our defenses, then we become free, free from choosing one side or the other at the expense of fooling ourselves with half realities. And that's what Jesus promised. In John chapter eight, it says, if the son has set you free, you'll be free indeed. Freedom from ignorance, freedom from shame, and freedom from perfection. Matthew 5, 48 says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. But the real translation of that is, be whole as your heavenly father is whole. Jesus saw his wholeness, his dark and lovely aspects. He reconciled them. And instead of those aspects beating each other up inside of him, causing tension within himself, he made peace between them. You and me, me and you, guess where we are? We're Christians, little Christs called to do the same thing he did. We're all dark but lovely. We're all guilty and not guilty. And what Christ calls us to do is this. It says he's before all things. Christ, he's before all things. He's holding light and dark at the same time. And here's, here's what he does. He holds that together. Can we hold the tension of both of that together within us? Can we hold it and rise above the debates and division in our world? Can we hold it together as people of the middle road, the narrow road, right? Nobody thinks like this. This is the narrow road that so few people dare go down. Can we be people who stop splitting and be a people who simply live the best we can, people who are good enough, people who stop beating ourselves up when we mess up, but people who get back on the horse when we fall down? If we can do that with ourselves, guess who we'll be able to do it with? Others. When we do that with others, when we're able to, when we do it with ourselves, then we're able to help others. Well, if we do that, then guess what we become? We become what Jesus taught. It says this. You'll, you'll, remember, you'll recognize it from the Beatitudes. It says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the reconciled. People who can hold the tension. Because you know what they'll be called? The children of God.